Hello. Lecture 4.0, if you will, the introduction to the chapter Robot Control Architectures. Robot control architectures are conceptual structures for organizing robot control such that we can design controllers systematically. All such architectures include maps of measurements to actions, a process that was central to our definition of intelligence in Lecture 1.5. We call this process Sense, Decide, Act, or SDA for short. With reference to figure 4.1, right here, sensing, or measurement, provides the robot with information about the state of itself and of the environment. So we've got the robot environment being sensed using sensors and then the sensor support devices and being fed back to the controller which decides. So from this a decision is made about how the robot should act. So that's what happens in the controller or controllers. Then actuators and effectors are used to act on the robot and environment. So from this a decision is made about how the robot should act and finally the robot acts through its actuators and effectors. The differences among robot control architectures lie almost entirely in the decide step, that is in the controller. The controller here is not necessarily a single device, although it can be. Control devices are frequently microcontrollers that include microprocessors, memory, and input-output interfaces. However, some control logic is so simple, it can be instantiated in analog or digital circuits alone. It is also notable that the diagram of figure 4.1 encompasses processes that can, ha can be happening asynchronously and in parallel. For instance, measurements may be made at different times. Controller decisions may take different times for different situations, etc. So this is not to say that this happens, then this happens, then this happens, and then that, that happens. It's not necessarily sequential like that, um, but these are the pathways that are followed and certain signals might be moving along here um, asynchronously from others. In fact, almost always that would be the case. From our understanding of feedback control theory, we can conceive of how we might control simple robot actions such as turning by some angle or raising an effector to some height. While feedback control systems of complex systems like a robot arm can be very complicated, they typically require low level commands, i.e. a goal state through time. For instance, move up to this height, move down to this height, etc. It might be more complicated than that. There might be multiple actuators involved, multiple degrees of freedom involved, and yet um, really virtually all of it is commanding to a state. That state could be more complex in some cases and more simple in others, but uh, feedback control systems effectively work by changing the commanded state and then having the control system react to it. Actions, tasks, and behaviors. As necessary as feedback control is, and it is, it is inadequate to command the robot to perform complex actions, such as finding an object or exploring an environment, i.e. high-level commands. But just such high-level commands are what a designer would like to give a robot. Sometimes, we say there are mid-level commands as well. So low-level, mid-level, and high-level. The mid-level commands are those that require more than low-level commands, but are probably lower level than a robot designer would like to give. In fact, we can categorize actions by command complexity. And so that's what we'll do here. Simple actions are those that require only low-level commands. For instance, moving an effector to a given state is a simple 
action. Tasks. Tasks are actions that require only mid-level commands. For instance, grasping an object in a gripper is a task. Behaviors are actions that require only high-level commands. For instance, following walls is a behavior. These categorizations are helpful, as we'll see, despite their obvious ambiguity. Is this particular action a behavior or is it a task? Is this other action a simple action or is it a task? Um, there's a lot of ambiguity here, but it does help organize our thinking. Models and their representation. Some robot control architectures use internal models to help the controller decide what to do. Models are typically mathematical models, maps of the environment, and mechanical solid models. Models, of course, need representations that can be stored in computer memory. However, models useful in many robot control applications take a lot of memory, i.e. they are memory intensive which is only the first of three major drawbacks to using models. The second is that using the models is processing intensive, which costs power, money, complexity, and most importantly, time. The third drawback is that these internal models don't age well and usually require constant updates in a dynamic environment. Despite the drawbacks, however, models are very helpful, especially when the robot is to be designed to exhibit a behavior that requires multiple steps to be effective. For instance, it's not hard to go from location A to location B when there are no obstructions. Just go toward B and you'll be fine. However, if there are obstacles, it is more difficult. And if there is a labyrinth, a map would surely help. So let's turn now to the architectures. There are four common robot architectures. Deliberative control is the first. Deliberative control makes extensive use of stored information and models to predict what might happen if different actions are taken, attempting to optimally choose a course of actions. This allows the robot to plan a sequence of actions to achieve complex goals or exhibit a behavior in, in uh, our, our language, thereby allowing a designer to give high-level commands that are interpreted in terms of extensive models. This paradigm is often called sense, plan, act, thereby substituting plan for decide in our usual sense, decide, act scheme. In essence, deliberative control decides actions through careful planning. Deliberation is costly in terms of the hardware required, the energy used by computation, and most importantly, time. Even with seemingly ever-increasing processing power, time remains the bottleneck for deliberative control. Pure deliberative control is rarely used, as we'll see but it is nonetheless indispensable for some behaviors. Reactive control. Reactive control is rather elegant in its simplicity. Simple rules map sense data to simple actions, but in combination, these rules interact to generate task level actions. So more complex than simple actions. Or perhaps it's better to say a designer arranges these simple rules to achieve modular task level actions. The most common variety of this architecture is the subsumption architecture, which uses the concept of layers, which can affect, subsume each other in limited ways we'll explore. Layers can frequently be constructed to yield task level actions but usually more is required to exhibit full-blown behaviors, right? Again, these categories are fuzzy, so sometimes simple reactive control will exhibit behaviors, um, and there's a, there's a very fuzzy line in between reactive control and what we'll soon call behavior-based control. Hybrid control. 
Okay, in hybrid control, a wedding is held for deliberative and reactive control in the hopes that each's positive qualities will be brought forth and negative qualities will be left behind. Do -do 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 we marry them together. This is probably the most popular approach, but it is very challenging to arbitrate between or mix two approaches in such a way that it doesn't comprise an unhappy union. Popular tasks for reactive control are danger zone shutdowns. So when the robot gets into a danger zone, it'll shut down. Obstacle avoidance, and pretty much any activity that requires a quick reaction. Left to deliberative control are the high level decisions that aren't too time sensitive, such as path planning, object recognition, and task coordination. Finally, behavior-based control. Behavior-based control tries to extend reactive control beyond tasks to behaviors, okay? More complex than tasks. This is really an attempt to design emergence, a behavior that is not explicitly commanded, but is comprised of simple actions running more or less in parallel. As we will see, reactive and behavior-based control rely heavily on lessons learned from biology, especially evolution and emergence. Each of these robot control architectures is explored in this chapter. Later, we will consider how to instantiate these in software and hardware, simulated and mechanical. All right, that's all I've got for you today. I'll see you in uh, uh, the next lecture.